welcome to Previously on X-Men, the podcast that looks at X-Men comics, movies, shows, characters, and more. I'm Hillary. And I'm Eric. Welcome back, Eric, after Thanks. betraying me to go to another podcast. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I just really had to talk about 90210. Just desperate for some and it had to be that specific episode I just had to talk about. <laughs> What am I going to do? Not not talk about it? The paternity case that Steve is dealing with. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I think they needed your expertise, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Who else would know? Who else would know about Steve's paternity? Yeah. Anyway, I was over on the library podcast. Did you listen to that? Have you tried? You should listen to it because you can listen to another guy be uncomfortable about me having feminist thoughts about something. (laughs) I'm uncomfortable with your themis- feminist thoughts. Feel- I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm always going to say something that then was the very wrong thing to say. Yes, and I will never forgive you. That is yeah. that That's is how it works. Usually, my fear, like, no. Mm-hmm. What I actually meant to say was, but it's I not that the women are well, not the women are well served in this. I meant that like they could be <laughs> less served in this movie if it was, you know, the '50s. What I'm, I'm Just actually keep saying going. is, Just keep going. It's good to have hot women over... Oh, no! (laughs) I said hot women! What have I done? No way! I meant to say... ah. (laughs) Yes, you're fine. Don't worry about it. I will not trap you. Not a lot of strong female characters in these episodes. No, I guess that's true. I didn't even really think about that. Rogue kind of takes a hike very early on. Storm is kind of there. Mystique stops having lines later on, and Psylocke is there for about 20 minutes. Yeah, I would uh, think there'd be more with Psylocke once she yeah. was popped in there, but oh well. Yep. Alright, well, let's see. We're talking about the four-parter, Beyond Good and Evil, mm-hmm. that aired on consecutive Saturdays from November 4th to 25th in 1995. Nice. Looks like they were all directed by Larry Houston, written by Steve yeah. Gooden, Jan Sternad and Michael Edens and Mm -hmm. uh, Dean Steffen. Oh, I have a note here that Michael Edens also wrote part of the Spider-Man crossover from our last episode, Mm. which was the April Fool's swap. Got you. Y'all thought it was going to be a normal episode, but it was a Spider-Man episode. Did you look silly? Someone who doesn't know anything about (laughs) Spider-Man or the (laughs) X-Men. I loved how many times Ellie was just like, nope, no idea. (laughs) Yeah. Good times. Good times. Yeah. Michael Eden has that, that he's popped up before as well. Yeah, I feel like I've seen the these show. names before at least yep. once. So I really want to like if we ever interviewed somebody on this show again, I really want to like ask about the process of having different writers on different episodes in multi-part episodes. Like why yeah. do you have one writer for part one and another writer for part two? It does seem like a pretty consistent trend. Yeah, it seems like something you'd want the same writer in. It does seem that way. Anyway. But that's just because we don't know their process. That's true. I don't know nothing. Uh, We open with our favorite time travel y people, Cable and his ragtag group. Yep. In 3999 AD in Cairo. Yeah. (laughs) You know, I love that it is. 4000 AD. I love that like when we go to Cable's future as of now, as of time of recording he's only like 25 years in the future Cable is always just thousands of years, just yeah. like just not part of anything really, you know, he's so far past anything we're watching normally Yeah, Things and like, like far that. enough that you really wonder, is this as different as it gets in like 2000 <laughs> years? Well, they would deal with Apocalypse. He he sent them back a bit. He's holding them back? Yeah, that's how it Okay, works. so Cable and his team, including Tyler, his son. Oh, boy. Have you seen him as an adult? Yes, this is his... I, is this the first time seeing him as an adult? It's, uh, the only thing I remember is Cable talking about him, like getting back to him because he was, what, yeah, sick or something? There was one where we saw him as a kid or teenager. He's like... <laughs> but his voice actor does not sound that much more grown up here. Yeah, yeah. And he calls him a, calls him dad so much. Yeah. Dad! That's my dad! Cable's my dad! Yeah. So they're trying to break into, I guess, the pyramid? Apocalypse's pyramid? 
yep. so that they can destroy the Lazarus chamber, which I keep yes. calling in my notes. I keep calling it the Lazarus pit, which is not. It's not the Lazarus the pit. Thing. DC would be very upset that you would even suggest That's a different that. different thing. So I apologize right now because it's I will probably definitely say that. Lazarus pit. It's the Lazarus chamber. Mm -hmm. And so they, they go through all kinds of things to get in, but eventually Apocalypse catches them and he takes Cable's time travel computer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which we learn later, I guess, is he he's like the only person who has one because they've they're like illegal now. Yeah, so Apocalypse takes it because he's like, this is the only power I've ever not had. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because at the commercial break, he says something like, your journey ends or something, and he goes, right now. <laughs> he like, just what a line to just drag on. But Cable says, like, you'll never win. People like me will always be there. Somebody uh -huh. will stop you. And then Apocalypse gets really introspective. He's like, like immediately, he's <laughs> like, oh. Yeah. It's like you should have, like, this close-up on his face, like, turned away. <laughs> you do <laughs> Maybe give you're me right. pause. Yeah. It's it's basically the Jafar moment. He's like, you're right. His, the genie does surpass my own. Ooh. But yeah, Apocalypse just, he just starts lamenting. He's like, am I doomed to eternity of fighting? But like, that's his thing. To just have people fighting nonstop until the strongest remain. So I don't know what his big issue is with all this. Yeah. Well, you sort of wonder what his ideal, but I guess you figure out sort of what his ideal scenario is toward the end. But yeah, he's like, all I do is try to get this like perfect world or whatever but there's always mm -hmm. somebody yeah. fighting me for like thousands of years yes maybe that's it maybe it's easy to say you support strongest of the fittest for like the first two thousand years but then three thousand years later you're like boy this is exhausting yeah i would just like to have my weird self world yeah this was a good idea back then but like we don't even have roads anymore <laughs> <laughs> so apocalypse leaves leaving cable alive he uses cable's time travel device and we cut to the one man's worth episode the end of it yep in 1950 when xavier is yep. not killed we're not really there because of anything that happened in that episode we're there because usually what happens with the time travel episodes with bishop is as soon as he leaves whenever we come to a new episode with him we cut back that's where he starts. So, like, Bishop is having... It, in this whole series, you could... If you did the math, I mean, is it even a long weekend that he's spending? I know. Bishop's just, like, bouncing like a pinball yeah. between, like... like every time, time he gets back, he has to go back. And, like, years are passing in real time. But, like, for him, he's just like, ah. Oh. But this time, as Beast later explains, he gets caught in Apocalypse's backwash, as yeah, he his, said. in his wake. <laughs> Yep, in his wake. So he starts to emerge back at his regular time in like Forge's lab and stuff. And they're like, oh, something's interfering. And yeah, he gets like sucked Not, back yeah. into whatever, like this time stream thing. He gets to the axis of all time and he meets the custodian of time who desperately, desperately wants to be Robin Williams as the genie. Yeah, right? Everything he does. I read that he is the voice. It's Steven Wiemet, who is also the voice of Beetlejuice in the animated series. So he's probably also kind of channeling a bit oh, yeah, of that okay. mania. Oh, and him and uh, Jubilee never get to interact. Is that a thing? Oh, is she in Beetlejuice too? She's the voice of Lydia. That's funny. Yeah, in Beetlejuice, the cartoon. This says that Steven Wiemet is that guy and Archangel. Yeah, yeah. That's funny. Because when we met Archangel, I do remember bringing that up, that he was also Beetlejuice. So there you go. Yeah, Beetlejuice was a big hit. Do you have, like, information about this? No. <laughs> uh oh. About this guy, the character, the time custodian I've guy. I've looked it up in the past, and I never remember what it is. He's well, not anyone. Well, that's disappointing. Because I was yes. watching it, and I was like, I don't know anything about this guy, but Eric will. <laughs> Eric will know. Nope. He's a funny little guy, isn't he? He is a fight. Well, he turns into somebody at the very end. Yeah, but he's one of those people who's like, oh, I should have, would have, could have. <laughs> yeah, it's too much. Like, it, it's... there's an extent to which, like, Bishop gets annoyed with him. And so I think that, like, when you're creating the show, you're like, yeah, he's annoying. We all recognize that he's annoying. But, like, he's too annoying. Like, everything he says is like, please, please mm -hmm. stop. 
I am begging you, sir. That's Immortus. I, that's the first time I've ever heard that name. He is the future self of Pharaoh Ramatut, Charles, uh, Kang the Conqueror, so... Oh, he's Kang the Conqueror? Yeah. You know, I think I, you think I would know that, but I didn't, so I have failed. You have failed as my Marvel encyclopedia. Yeah. Sorry. Kang, Kang the Conqueror's, like, other aliases through times definitely, like, pass over me all the time. I never can remember who's what. Every time they're like, oh, Pharaoh Ramatut, I'm like, right. And that's Red Skull? So. <laughs> well, um, they do it to themselves. Yep. So anyway, so, yeah, Bishop is, is now trapped at the axis mm-hmm. of time, which apparently he knows nothing about, which is interesting because he's like this time traveler guy but he's, yeah he's never he's, he's never shown up here before yeah and, and he's trapped it's like outside like no of time should. yeah right and the custodian's there and and bishop just begins his four episode long stroll along this oh, golden boy. road yeah you would think such a heavy time travel episode would have more for him to do that was not, not the case no it's a lot of him walking but he watches and he sees the x-men and he realizes that's happening and we cut to that. It's the real wedding of Scott and Jean at last. For real. They actually get married successfully. They've been waiting and waiting. And now they finally get... I don't know what they waited for. Why it took this many episodes for them to be like, okay, we can do a real wedding. You don't even Weddings have to tell. Weddings take a lot of planning, Eric. At this point, just go to... Uh, what do you call them? The justice of the peace? The or justice whatever? of the peace, yeah. Well, remember, yeah, just... we've just said, like, in a recent episode, we kind of, like, figured out that, like, this is, the whole series has been, like, a six weeks of mania for the X-Men. That's so maybe true. they just haven't had time. I, I just feel like if I was their friends, I'd be like, can we just not do another whole wedding and I'm just do, do like, whole thing. you guys can just go somewhere and get the certificate. We all did the wedding. It was very nice. But they give they give the viewer a good chunk of time. Like they don't rush this wedding. You see the wedding. You see they go to the reception. People are talking about how great it is that they're together and isn't it beautiful? Yeah, Rogue catches the bouquet. Yes, Wolverine yeah. is like, oh, I just can't. And then he cuts. <laughs> Wolverine goes up to Scott during the uh, when they're cutting the cake, and he he's like, you better cake? not, yeah. you better not, whatever, blah. But then he uses his his claw and cuts a piece of cake but not for himself he doesn't take for it Xavier he just cuts a piece of cake and puts it on a plate and Scott's like okay well here this is for Xavier I was coming up here anyway for Xavier's but this is a good time as any I might as well I mean we you know I know we all know I'm gonna have to say something so here we go yeah yeah he said Ro catches the bouquet like you said and she's like fat a lot of good this will do me. Yeah, and it's kind of sad. Funny and, and Gambit's sad. not there to see Gambit's it not anything. there! I thought for sure this was a, a rogue Gambit moment, but nothing. Yeah, I thought, not even like, for him to be like... It, yeah. She'd look and Gambit would be put, tugging it on his collar. He's like, oh. <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> Marriage is such a commitment. Yeah. Nope. But we don't. But then, at the very end, there's, like, Gambit messes with the car like you do and all this stuff, and they're ready to drive mm-hmm. off and storm Doggone it, just has to jinx it. Yeah, it's her fault, if anybody's. It's 100% Storm's fault. Why would she say that? What was she thinking? They're just about to drive away, and she's like, isn't it great (laughs) that everything has gone so smoothly with this wedding? Nothing has gone wrong. Isn't that so great? And then there's an explosion, a flash, an explosion. We find out it's the Nasty Boys. They're back. Nasty Boys. Yep. They just like appear. Punk rock band from the 80s, the Nasty Boys. The Nasty Boys. Also, did you hear <laughs> Xavier, like the explosion or whatever happens, and Xavier's like, oh no, I turned off the security thing for the wedding. Yeah. Why? After last wedding? Why would you security. ever just don't do that? Yeah, aren't there like out of mutants? respect for the ceremony? <laughs> like, why yeah. would you do that anyway? Call up Colossus and ask him to work security. Just, Just do a know, lap around the mansion. More than last time, anything. Anyway, so Scott and Jean are in a convertible. They get stopped by the nasty boys, and they're all fight, 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 fight. But then yep. they take—I don't remember how exactly they do this—but they, they take, take the Jean. entire car. Yeah, the oh boy. Uh, they they just carry it. They carry the big car, the car out, and go through a portal. 
they only take Jean, as we find out, and that's yep. all like, but why? Yeah, and Sinister it, Sinister says something about it. He's like, yeah, well, it's it's Jean's time or something. Yep. And they just leave Scott behind, which is very sad for Scott. Yeah, so the X-Men find that out. Xavier tells Jubilee to ha- make the guests leave. Yes. And it's very like, why don't you use your psychic powers to have all the guests leave? Just, just make them leave. We cut to Deathbird trying to take over the throne from Lalandra with the Shi'ar. And it turns out Apocalypse asked her to do that so he could get a hold of her psychic oracle, the Imperial Guard member with psychic mm-hmm. powers. And then she tells Xavier what's going on. Oh, it's so funny because Exa- uh, Sinister comes by himself to capture Xavier. Mm-hmm. And he's like carrying him, and the nasty boys are there. He's like, I need a portal out of here. And then he's like, a second time, he's like, I need a portal. And then the third portal's like, <laughs> somebody give me a portal. <laughs> yeah. The nasty boys just ditch him. They're like, I don't know. We've yep. got this one. You just deal with Crack your own thing. Up just how desperate he yep. was. Portal. Somebody, portal. Hello. Anybody. Minister okay. here with the savior. <laughs> kind of a, a big portal. deal. <laughs> Yeah, and it's funny, too, because, like, the Nasty Boys, when they ditch him, they're like, Xavier's your thing. Like, we're not even going to mess with this. And you sort of get the impression that Sinister just sort of, like, also wants to grab Xavier, but it's not really part of the plan, so they don't don't mess (laughs) with it. But it's not, actually, it's kind of a huge part of the plan, ultimately. But he fails to get him because somebody, is it Rogue? Rogue, like, swoops in and grabs Xavier just as uh, Sinister is going through the portal so xavier Mm -hmm. safe for now i want to say at this point Mm -hmm. this is there's a lot of bouncing around different times and stuff and like figuring out like you place bishop where he's going to be for the whole time and you're sort of like getting a lot from a lot of different places and times you have space you have way in the future you have back in the past and i thought that it worked pretty well so far to do that yeah they all, all episodes do that, like, going back and forth. I don't feel like you're ever lost. Like, oh, wait, which, what are these characters doing? Yeah. They, they go really big with, like, the cast of characters, but it's not too big. Like, you could also have brought in, like, the mutates from the Savage Land. You could have brought in the more, mm, you could have mm-hmm. had just, like, nonstop characters showing up. But even though it does feel like everybody is here, it's still pretty focused. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's a really good balance of like home base, just like regular X-Men and then like bringing Mm -hmm. in random like, oh, and also Psylocke is here in England randomly. And like Mm -hmm. this, they, yeah, it's like they pick and choose just the right people and areas. I was impressed that they were able to do as much nonsense and make it cohesive. Yeah. So Xavier deduces that they're going after psychics. And so he's like, we need to go to the psychics and Cyclops suggests using them as bait. And he's like, we can't tell them it would disrupt the plan. And Gambit's like, well, if they're psychic, they probably already know. Yeah. The storm says that's not funny, but it's like, but I mean, <laughs> it's not wrong. It's not, not funny. I like later on, we get kind of an explanation of why a psychic, like a telepath might also have like precog abilities and stuff. And I mm-hmm. thought that was helpful because when yeah. when Gambit said that, I was like, but that's not what they do. They don't tell the future. It's not oh, that but, kind of psychic. But he's also saying they would figure out the plan anyways, just being around them. But you're right, the precog thing makes more sense. So So okay, this work. this first episode ends with a glimpse at the axis of time with Gene in like a tube. And Sinister is like, haha, I've captured you or whatever. And then Apocalypse walks in and is like, mm. I'm the one who told Sinister to get you. And so you start to see the pieces coming together. But yeah. as far That's as the X Men know, this is all just a sinister plot. Yep. At this point, uh, it really is a sinister plot, too. Sure is sinister. Oh, sinister. So that's the end of episode one. Episode two, we finally see Psylocke in this show. We <laughs> haven't seen her. And she was big in the 90s. So it's really weird to me that it took so long to get to Psylocke at all. Yeah, but she's she's cool. I like I like what they do with her. It doesn't feel uh, like she's shoehorned cool. in or anything. Sorry. <laughs> 
I don't mean unlike Psylocke. I mean, they do a good job with her character. Mm-hmm. Okay, so how does she... Oh, yeah, it's Castle Worthington. She's on the boat. In yep, she's going to Castle Wor- Worthington for some reason. Worthington has a castle. Worthington yeah, being and it's an not angel super being clear archangel. because, yes, she's Archangel is hanging out in his castle, and Psylocke... Yeah. Is trying to steal paintings. She's just and stuff. robbing from him. Yeah, she's just he robbing because he's rich. He says it's for her brother. Yeah, Captain Britain. Why would she do that? He needs money. <laughs> I, this is again. I thought that you would be able to explain this to me, but okay. You want me to explain something about Captain Britain? Nuh-uh. You're right. Go, no, you're, you're right. Go to a different podcast. Okay. Okay. Fine. So no, anyway, no she's... Captain Britain explanations happening in this this realm. Psylocke is trying to steal from Archangel. Archangel kind of plays with her a little bit. He doesn't seem to be, like, mad that someone's trying to steal yeah, from him. Yeah, he's like, oh, I have a house guest and everything. Yeah. And she flips him, and he says, all right, that was two mistakes, yours and mine. And I'm like, dang! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> <came> to play! <laughs> so she's trying to steal stuff. He confronts her, finally, in the storage yeah, he place says, he says stuff about his collection he's like oh be careful that's a a thing that's really important yeah and i'm very and, rich uh, and she's mad at yeah. him because he doesn't use his wealth for anything good then Sabretooth bursts through the door with mystique oh that's after he follows her because she knocks him out and then he continues to follow her to london because he also she also took his car and everything Right. Uh, so yeah, at her hideout, she explains like, "You have all this wealth and you're not using it." Blah blah blah. And he's like, "You're still a thief." And yeah, and then Sabretooth and Mystique show up, and Mystique says, "I'll take on Worthington. You get the girl." And Sabretooth is dealing with Psylocke as she flips him, and Sabretooth says, "Oh man, was that ever the wrong thing to do?" And I'm like, "All right, I don't know. That was just it was just a cool line. It was mm-hmm. just a fun line. Yeah. Maybe not There's cool, a lot of- but." Like, very quick, my my notes here are Sabretooth burst in with Mystique, then Wolverine burst in, bursts in with Shard, and then yeah, Magneto bursts in. Of, <laughs> there's a lot of bursting in yes. on these episodes. So, they're fighting, then Wolverine comes in and takes on Sabretooth, Sabretooth as he is yeah. about to do. Okay, here's the thing I have an issue with. When they're waiting to find Psylocke, Bishop's sister, Shard, has come to the pass as well. Wolverine and Shard are waiting to find her. And he Was says, Is that what they're doing? Up. They're looking for Psylocke? I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't they're pick waiting up on for that. her because they're out for psychics. Okay. And he says, Wake me up if you see a beautiful black haired psychic appear or something. And then Angel says that raven haired. Her hair is purple. Right, that's the thing. We got two people referring to it as black, but the hair is purple. It's, it's very purple. purple. <laughs> Everything, like, it's been purple since she first appeared. That's And it's funny. always purple. It's crazy. It drives yeah. me crazy. Maybe it's one of those things where, like, you know how sometimes they'll use blue to shade for black? You know what I mean? Maybe they think, maybe, like, the writers think that that's what it is with... With People Psylocke's see colors hair. differently. It's weird, but they it's do. true, right? They because do. Because my sister never knew that she was always weirded out that I thought Spike from Cowboy Bebop had green hair. She's like, it's not green. Oh, it is like, green. It's it's green. It is green. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do? That is another. I, can, I could see that she would think that was a shading thing, though. Yeah. Magneto shows up, like you said, and it's a weird new voice actor who does not sound good. Yeah, it's a guy from a previous episode that I think is the episode that you weren't here for. The Bloodlines episode? Yeah. Not Bloodlines, the father and the... the yes, yeah, I know when what you're he talking was the, about. the dad. But it's, it's a bummer because all the other voice actors are here and he's not. And he, he has, you know, he's got a great voice. Yeah, right, it's 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 a shame. He doesn't have as he doesn't have too many lines that are like, oh, that other guy would have nailed that. But it, he just ends up being sort of like a whatever. He always sounded yeah. It it didn't. It sounded like he had mileage behind him in terms of mm-hmm. maybe the bad things he's done. Yeah, and anytime he said something, you believed he was gonna do that. Like mm-hmm. it, but yeah, this other guy's just like, oh hi, I'm just. Yeah. Here to pick the kids up. I hope yeah, they had a good time whatever. at the barbecue. He's like, he's fine, but he doesn't bring anything special to it. Yeah. Yeah. But he's apparently also in on this mm-hmm. getting the psychics thing. Yep. So he captures Psylocke. 
he, he traps Wolverine on a boat and then he drops the boat like he's Michael Fassbender lifting a big object <laughs> and then dropping it. He drops it on whatever, the building, I guess. So there goes yep. all of the rich people stuff that, yeah. that was stored there. Yeah, so then it seems like Sabretooth and Mystique are sort of one team and then Magneto was sent separately. Like it sort of feels like all of these different villains have been hired or whatever to do this, but they aren't really communicating mm -hmm. with each other at this stage. Yeah, it does kind of seem like Magneto was in the neighborhood. He's like, yeah, I can stop by. Yeah, right? <laughs> I, I can hop up. I'll be there. But then Storm and Gambit show up and Storm mm -hmm. cleans up the debris from the building, I guess. Okay, so they've got Jean, they've got Psylocke, they've got uh, the Oracle they've from the got Shi'ar. Rachel Summers. You see Rachel Summers at one point. So we end episode two. Mm -hmm. We've got all of the the psychics lined up in the axis of time. Yep. Mystique and Magneto are revealed to be part of this whole apocalypse plan. Magneto apparently is doing it so that apocalypse will resurrect his wife. That is the only time we yes. hear anything about this, but that's, yeah, and <laughs> that's he's, why. It's funny because he says resurrection is a tricky business. And it's like, but just do time travel then. Just go ahead and do time travel. Because if you go into the past and you get somebody like the second before they die and then bring them into the future, you avoid most... Resurrection! Time. Right, boom. That wasn't tricky at all. I forgot I'm in... But we, we learn later that... Even Magneto wasn't going to fall for it. So. Yeah, yeah. So there is that. But then, okay, so we've got Sinister is in place. Magneto and Mystique are in place. They've lost Sabretooth. The X-Men captured him. We get back to Cable and Tyler, and they've decided that they're going to get a time machine to go mm -hmm. back and destroy, not the pit, the Lazarus, Lazarus chamber. Lazarus chamber. Yep. The Lazarus chamber, like, before it's built or, like, the first time that it existed or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's their plan. That's the yep. end of episode too. It reminded me how little Mystique is really used in this show, considering how important she is. True. But I also kind of feel like Mystique's importance in the X-Men as like a villain. I don't know. Like it kind of grew because she was part of Freedom Force in the 80s and they were like the government sanctioned mm -hmm. team. And then in the 90s, she was working for X-Factor. And so Maybe during this show, it is kind of like, well, is Mystique really, like, the villain we're going to be using and stuff? Yeah, Mystique's character sort of grows so much that it's, yeah, like, at this moment, yeah. what is she? But yeah, when Psylocke first appeared, it just kind of hit home even more. It's like, wow, they never even, like, reference Kitty Pride. <laughs> That's true. And, like, we know their reasons why, but it's just kind of wild that, like, she never even appears in a cameo of, like, yeah. all these mutants, and it's like... You know, you see everybody work and you don't just see her like going to school or going through a yeah, wall. Yeah, years later, they couldn't just like drop something. And she becomes such an important part of the X-Men in like the comics. And she's just nowhere. She's nowhere to yeah. be seen. Poor kitty. And so the thing is, in they call it Cable's future now, the 4000 AD. That is a handy thing. When we get to episode three. They're breaking down a uh, force field so Cable can get into Grey Malkin, which is a time travel device that the government kept on. Now, that was a familiar name. Have we seen that before? Yeah, it's in the comics. The very first thing we see in episode three is Bishop walking. <laughs> yep. Yet again. Yeah. He's just trying to walk to the center. Yeah, I, I think he's trying to get because there's like custodian. a there's like a planet shaped something or other at the center of this yep. axis. And yeah, he's just walking, trying yep. to find it. Cable mentions that there was a nuclear nuclear disarmament in the 21st century, but every country kept one bomb just in case. He means the future 21st Right, okay. Yeah, we were still in the 90s watching this, so he's like, someday! Mm -hmm. Wishful thinking, Cable. Okay, so Cable and Tyler, they get the Grey Malkin time machine. It involves a whole shebang. Periodically, we see Apocalypse in the axis of time being like, ah, oh, yes, mm -hmm. they are going, everything is going according to my plan. So everything that we see that's like Cable or the X-Men or anybody being like, okay, so now we've got a plan. We'll, we'll end up seeing Apocalypse being like, yep, this is all, this is going the way I want it yes, to. Finally. 
So somehow he, I feel like Apocalypse does something that causes Grey Malkin to go off course. I don't remember what he did, but Grey Malkin ends up going to present day X-Men mansion. Basically the wedding. Yeah. I mean, the, the guests are leaving and he shows up. Yeah, he stumbles out. What am I doing yeah. here? <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> they're all like, yeah, what yeah, are you Xavier's doing? Xavier's like, I'll have the same question. Uh, Cable seems less helpful in this these episodes than normal because he's just like, I don't care about anything. I'm just here to rescue, like, to save my son. And it's very like, you've been more effective in the... He, he used to be a cooler character. Not cooler, like sick wicked but like <laughs> he used to be more you know like a cool customer like even I guess, when it came to this yeah. stuff yeah he used to be like eh, you know is the x-men all right we'll stop apocalypse yeah know. that's true i guess i feel like at this stage he's just sort of been pushed to kind of a frantic place yeah he's he's done he's ready to be done yeah. with this they decide the X-Men and Cable are going to team up. So they all go into the mansion. Uh, Beast is working with Shard to try to figure out what happened to Bishop. And that's when they figure out yep. that he was probably caught in the wake of some larger thing. They don't know what, but some other larger mm -hmm. player going right. through the time stream. We see Cyclops and Angel have started to interrogate <laughs> Sabretooth. And Wolverine shows up and is like, hey, uh, Xavier... Want, wants you guys so go away and so they leave and wolverine fights with Sabretooth, as we might expect but he's yeah he he lets him loose and then he shuts the door right as Sabretooth runs yeah at him. so he's gonna do Which some cool hardcore shot. interrogating is what we are to assume here yeah. uh cable is yeah. debriefing the x-men now around their little table thing that they do about apocalypse's lazarus chamber and that he's got time travel now and what what we're gonna do and Wolverine comes in, bursts in, you might say, and throws Sabretooth on the floor and is like, I've got part of his plan and all this stuff. And Xavier uh -huh. hesitantly decides that he's going to read Sabretooth's mind. It's so funny because they're like, what did you see? He's like, clocks, yes! calendars, <laughs> or glasses. I think it has something to do with time. <laughs> but he, ha he seems to think that he has... An idea of Apocalypse's plan. His idea seems to be that Apocalypse has a plan. But anyway, mm -hmm. he figures that out. And the X-Men and Archangel go with Cable. And they're like, okay, we're going to figure out where he is. I guess maybe they're going to try to go to the axis of time. Yeah. And find Apocalypse. They're going to Cairo to take care of the Lazarus chamber, chamber now. Yep. Because his time machine can't work. But if they can take care of it now, then they can still stop him in the future. Or at least that's... The hope slash theory. Yeah, yeah, because I guess maybe then he would never have existed, so he can't go back in time. I don't know. Time mm -hmm. travel is madness. So Cable and the X-Men, everybody, show up in Egypt. Same deal with the pyramid, and mm -hmm. they're going to sneak in. It looks like there's building materials, so they're like, great, we're here just in time. They're working on the Lazarus chamber. We can do this. So Storm and Archangel kind of scout ahead for a second. They all go in and there's booby traps and things. I thought this was going to be a thing because there's a moment where they're walking through the cave or whatever, the entrance, and Wolverine smells pine or something. Yeah, he says fre fresh tree, tree sap. sap. Yeah, and uh, Cable is like, I know where all of the booby traps are, so whatever. But then it turns out that it was a booby trap that he didn't know about. And then there's a whole conversation where he's like, well, why don't I, why didn't I know about that one and all this stuff? And so I was like, oh, okay. It's because they came back and put that there, but they never really do anything with that. Yeah, th that's the only time he has to deal with the trap. So they get in and they think that they're like at the place. We're going to deal with this. And then the horsemen attack. Yeah. So Apocalypse must have come back in time like present day whatever apocalypse is now back and the horsemen are attacking yep and cable gets hurt so they're like we'll leave cable behind because it's it really is just fighting with the like generic horsemen not even the uh yeah it's like no interesting characters as the horsemen it's just right. like regular metal dudes flying right. around but they leave cable behind and go there to destroy it and Apocalypse still captures Xavier. Yeah, because they had Mystique pretending to be Apocalypse in the 
chamber. Yeah. Wolverine jumps in to try to save Xavier, and now psychics start spinning around in a circle in a blue ring. You see Rachel Summers in her red spiky outfit. You see Strife, you see Moon Dragon, you see Typhoid Mary, which I thought was a fun cut. You see Emma Frost, and you see somebody who I assume is supposed to be one of those Guardians of Oa. Yeah, yeah, like a little blue dude. Like a Guardians of Oa stand yeah, 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 which I don't know why they picked that one specifically, but he gets to be a part of things. So yeah, once we have Xavier, yep. we have everybody. And that is the end of episode yep. three. Episode four begins, yep. Bishop is walking. Yep. And he finally starts getting to do something because now his goal is to go to that nexus. And then he shoots during the episode, he shoots one of them and releases uh, Psylocke. Yeah, he starts to have any He's effect like, on the storyline at all at this point. So this is the episode we learn what Apocalypse's main plan is. Yes, and boy, is it grandiose. He wants to wipe out all of existence mm -hmm. through time. Yep. He's going to everything that was and will be gone and then from the nexus he's going to create a new universe in his image where he gets to yes. rule and this is where he's talking about the link between the psychics and the time stream whatever yes all psychics have a bit time and thought are linked because psychics have clairvoyancy even if it's a small amount thus Psychics are able to transcend through time. So that's why he's collected all of these powerful psychics so that when they all die and are destroyed, their psychic energy death will cause the death of all time. And he gives this supervillain monologue to another supervillain, which is an interesting little twist. He's talking to Magneto. Yeah, he gives it to Magneto, and, Magneto and Mystique are like, uh, what's the plan? He's like, oh, fine. Yep. I can wait another two minutes. And yeah, Magneto's like, you said we were going to create a new timeline where mutants rule over humans. Like, that's much better. But also, I thought you were here for your dead wife. Yeah. Well, you sort of wonder because, like, he, he decides that all of this is insane and he can't possibly help Apocalypse anymore. Yeah. But he also indicates that he has never super actually been on Apocalypse's side. Yeah, he never trusted Apocalypse. Yeah. That's why they take care of him and throw him out a window and he's like, I never trusted you. Now I have control of the Citadel or whatever and I'm going to make my own universe and my yeah. own image. There's a whole thing. Sinister shows up and Magneto's like, don't you see what he was doing? He's like, yeah, I was yeah. down for it. Sinister I love the, the idea. the idea of great. creating a whole new universe. Sinister was really excited about the time portals because he could start a experiment mm -hmm. in one portal and then travel into the future to see the results so he didn't have to be immortal i thought that was a really good motivation yeah. for sinister to make it really like tied mm -hmm. to his experiments because that would be helpful to just like yeah. jump to when the experiment is complete it's interesting that sinister's here gosh i mean this is the first time sinister's been here since season two is that true I, I mean, he, he hasn't been in really anything since, and he's, he's really just like a lackey. Yeah, definitely. This one. He doesn't do anything other than bring the nasty boys and also, like, try to capture Xavier, but then, of course, he fails. Like, there's no, like, here's one of my creations mm, now. Yeah, that's true. With. He doesn't get too many action moments. They bring him in because he's a big guy, but I sounded like Christopher Walken there. For guy. A second. He's a big guy. <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of like a downgrade from Sinister being like the main villain of all of season two. Well, it's with his pragmatism, right? Like he he just sees his yeah. role in this. He's like, I'm just going to ride the coattails of this like insane supervillain yeah. and get what I can get out of the situation. Yeah. But luckily, there is a homing device on Xavier. And so the X Men start heading towards the axis and they have this whole thing where they're like the computer can't find him in the time stream oh he's outside the time right. stream wow and then they go to find him. yes because they're in gray Mulkin traveling through time they're now coming from ancient egypt to this time and magneto you know starts fighting everybody him and mystique they teamed up uh mystique says go on without me i'll slow them down like that's gonna work but it does like i like mystique. <laughs> there's no i know but like 
don't worry, I'll shape shift in well, front of them. Is, you know, she does flips and crap. She's she's doing stuff. And yeah. she has like a little laser gun thing. Yeah. <laughs> Magneto frees Wolverine, which surprises Wolverine. He's like, whoa, you're yeah. serious. He like All bursts right. into the Magneto comes into the room where Wolverine is and he's like, Okay, we gotta do this and this and this and, this. and Wolverine's like, Are you talking to me? <laughs> yeah. It's a fun moment. That is really this is what I mean where it just becomes action, because it really is at this point just fighting because Bishop starts freeing the psychics mm -hmm. uh, by shooting at the chair. Yeah, roots. Bishop, who, who is completely outside of the situation, like he has no idea yeah. what is happening. So we, we're bouncing between like insanity in the center of the axis of time mm -hmm. with like Apocalypse is fighting, Sinister is fighting, all of like Wolverine and Cable shows up with the other X-Men and Apocalypse starts his plan. Like it's now starting. Yep. And so the ring starts to glow and all of this insane stuff is happening. And then we cut to Bishop who has no idea. He's just dealing with this annoying guy following him around. And he's like, well, that looks weird. That ring wasn't there before. And so he just shoots it. Blam, and blam, it's like blam, blam. pivotal <laughs> to them yep. defeating Apocalypse, but has no idea what he's doing. Yeah, he, he's that Danny DeVito meme where he's like, so I just started blasting. <laughs> That's what he does. He just sees something blastable. Magneto is taken out by Apocalypse, and so he starts falling, and so Wolverine catches him uh, from falling into nothingness, and he's like, look who I'm saying, you think I was Xavier? And then Wolverine gets thrown down, and Magneto mm -hmm. saves him. He's like, look who I'm yep. saving, you think I'd be an X-Men. <laughs> That's very fun. And then we have Cable, yeah. I mean, maybe this is the same time. Hillary, there's no time You're at right. this moment. Bishop comes in, so I guess he's there now, he attacks Apocalypse as well, everybody's going after Apocalypse. It seems like Apocalypse is out because they like knock him into the time stream, but then he's back. The horseman saved him. And so all this insanity keeps happening. But then ultimately, the psychics who were freed by Bishop all team up. And Xavier <laughs> gets kind of, I don't know, like a tough guy. And he, they're all floating with Xavier at the front. And Xavier is like, our power in this realm is more than yours, Apocalypse, and we will take you out of the axis of time and you will cease to exist. Yep. So one thing we have kind of glossed over about why Apocalypse wanted to do this because he realized he would never win is because the show is positioning Apocalypse as the embodiment of the concept of evil. Right, yeah. Like, he is the living avatar of evil, mm -hmm. and you can't defeat him because you need good and yeah. evil. But he doesn't like that himself because now he knows he'll never win because there will always be right. good. So if he destroys all of time and everything, this whole good and evil will be gone. Right. And Cable and uh, Beast kind of embody this conversation conversations about throughout this, the whole like, time. Maybe he can't be mm -hmm. beat. Philosophical yeah. And it's very like it's very philosophical, it's very poetic, it's a little too silly, I think. With apocalypse though? I mean he's I I know he's so grandiose and everything, but like to say he's the embodiment of all evil. I guess I, don't I didn't know. see the show as saying that so much as like Cable has come to this conclusion, and so he's pushing right. that narrative. But then Beast pushes uh -huh. back on him a bit, you know, with that. Like, you really think that he's just evil? And then they have the conversations, but I feel like Beast is sort of playing with like within Cable's rules. Like, I don't think Beast thinks mm -hmm. that Apocalypse is the embodiment of evil, but he's sort of like, if you think, let's accept. <laughs> that <laughs> apocalypse is the embodiment of evil do you really think that that can right be whatever so i didn't feel super like it was the actual message just sort of like let's have a conversation about this yeah let's discuss so anyway the psychics take down apocalypse mm -hmm. officially because his lazarus chamber has been destroyed so to remove him from the axis means he no longer can exist in time yeah. and space. So we've got a lot of good teamwork because like the reason that the uh -huh. psychics can do that is because Bishop and them destroyed the Lazarus. Well, thing. Bishop also shows up and shoots Apocalypse during one of his speeches. Yes. So it's a lot of, I think it's cool that they like set up all the different blocks that had to fall for this to ultimately mm -hmm. happen. Yeah. 
for like all the different pieces around. I think it was pretty successful as far as that goes. But then they're done and everybody's back at the mansion and everything is fine. And that's the end. <laughs> that's the end. Yeah. The this was considered this was planned to be the final episode of the whole series. Like they thought they were done. They thought they were being canceled. So they decided to go out with a big bang. So their last image was gonna be Cable in Grey Malkin's spaceship time travel machine saying, I'm heading home to my son, mm -hmm. and then disappears in the stars. Yeah. They didn't give a lot of time to the X-Men in the conclusion. No, the conclusion has more Magneto than X-Men, and we did spend like the whole first half of the second episode with Angel and Psylocke. Yeah. I guess I if if it had actually been the end, I might have been a little like I don't mind I don't mind the level of X Men that exists in the overall episodes, but like just for the very very like the ending wrap up, mm -hmm. you just don't like you're back at the mansion, and I guess yeah, Magneto talks to Xavier, and then you have the stuff with Cable leaving, but it doesn't feel like you get a lot. Like I would have wanted them to have like okay, all of the X Men now have resolved this big situation and here's where the x-men will be going into the future and you just don't really get anything like that no i probably wouldn't have loved that <laughs> but then they decided not to be done i guess they weren't canceled uh yeah fox decided they wanted more episodes and so they did and so they did so how would you feel if this was the actual finale of the show if this had been the actual end i it would have been interesting because it would definitely be positioning Apocalypse as the main villain of the mm -hmm. series in a lot of ways. Yeah. That, like, you could end it when they finally defeat Apocalypse. And it almost is saying, like, well, the through line, the thing that we've always been building to is Cable and Apocalypse. Mm, that's true, yeah. And it would have been, it's, I don't believe Bishop is back in any other episodes. But I don't think it's like the strongest Bishop showing because he's just stuck there dealing with that really annoying yeah. character. I mean, he does save the day because he frees the psychics, which allow them to defeat Apocalypse. Yes. But it takes three and a half episodes for him to do yeah. anything. He sort of basically serves as like a previously on X-Men guy. Yeah. So you're telling me you built a time machine? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would have been unique because it's not like cartoons got big complete endings mm -hmm. back then you know some were able to do it but it would have been i feel like it would have been unique at the time to have a show like we know we're going out so we're doing this mm -hmm. big ending thing but in terms of like what the x-men are mm -hmm. about it's it's not so much an ending for yeah. that which is hard to do because you're basically for the x-men to completely win you basically have to say we've defeated racism yeah <laughs> you know that would be that'd be what their ending in the real world yeah, would be like. that's true. Like, good news bigotry and racism they're are gone, gone they're forever. not a thing anymore Yay. and so yeah you have to come up with a villain for something like this for them to fight and they choose apocalypse because he is big and everything but it doesn't really say like and after this the x-men keep fighting for what they yeah. believe in yeah defeating that. apocalypse yeah so uh, yeah i agree i think that it's it works really well for like what it's trying to do in its own little bubble i think it's cool that it's such a big epic thing for a finale like that's really mm -hmm. cool that they did that i think that they bring back all the right characters it, whether they do the right things with them for like a story arc overall probably up for debate mm -hmm. but they bring all back the right people which is cool yeah i think i probably would have been like okay yeah cool great but I, I definitely missed the uh, actual like wrap up for the characters of the X Men that you've been wanting to to follow the whole time. It's Cable's story, really, and like I said, it's not his best for him too. I feel like it's not his best showing. He's weirdly like whiny in this in a way that he normally isn't. Yeah, that's true. There's some nice continuity that makes some of the standalone nature of the previous seasons feel a little better. Mm -hmm. Like, the fact that we cut back to one man's worth. So, like, you know, that was all kind of a race. So, it's nice that we go back to that. And 
that uh, Magneto Scarlet Witch Quicksilver episode then gets to be played with the I'm going to bring back your wife. That's true. Situation. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You know, it's nice that it can do yeah. that. I guess. Well, I think that, you know, the lack of a continuous storyline that both we and I think the creators lament, mm -hmm. they do manage to sort of make it seem like in hindsight, like there was that kind of a through line. Right. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I think I liked it overall. I think it was, I think it was pretty successful. Okay. I do like it. I remember being kind of whatever about it in the past. I guess this is where you get like, it's a cartoon that adults can also mm -hmm. watch. You get more of the cartoon element on so when it becomes like very action heavy. Yeah. I feel like that's when it's a lot more cartoon than for adults because the action has to be very safe true in a lot of ways but a lot also of the animation people. is so, <laughs> yeah there's a lot of throwing and quips and stuff and i think that's where my brain turns off whereas like i really like the character interactions and those mm -hmm. moments yeah that's where you lose my son immediately as soon as there's like a calm yeah. moment with like two characters having a meaningful conversation my son is out the door right <laughs> But then you have like 15 minutes of just throwing each other and that's where I'm kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But again, it's a Saturday morning cartoon that adults can also watch. So that's, it's hard to kind of complain and be like, well, this isn't made yeah. for me. It was like, yeah, it was in the nineties. It's not necessarily made for me now as I'm 37 right. years old, I'm probably going to want a little bit more crunch. If they're going to choose but... like in the balance between kids and adults, if they're going to choose one, they're going to choose kids. Yes. That is what they should do. I mean, the concept of like time and like Apocalypse whole explanation of his plan and everything, it'd be interesting to <laughs> talk to kids watching it and be like, all right, so <laughs> what do you think is happening right now? <laughs> yeah. Ah, Apocalypse wants to destroy all time because that would destroy the embodiment of good and evil. God. <laughs> Obviously. All right. Sorry, I'll never complain about the action. Interestingly, again. they never ring in the connection between space and time, and I would be very interested if they would have yeah. That's yeah. how kids talk, I think, usually. What on earth? All right. That's that one. Yep. Our next episodes are going to be uh, the two another two parter. So this is the Phalanx Covenant. Yeah, that's a word you don't want to get wrong. <laughs> I have very like child like memories of this phalanx thing like i have like it's mm -hmm. all images and feelings about this so i'll be yeah. interested to watch this you might again. be thinking about the yeah i'll bring it up next time but you might be thinking of the ducktales episode where the entire world is turning to Duck gold tales. Woo! oh that's terrifying as a child <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to even think about the concept but if i'm gold what do i it's a whole thing Yep. So that's what's it, what we're going to be doing next time for the animated series. Whoa. And that wraps us up for season four. Season four. One more season to go. And probably by the time we finish that season, we'll be able to do the brand new season. Yeah. Oh, my word. Which I was excited about and then annoyed about. And now I'm kind of like, okay, I could watch that. So that's where we are for that. <laughs> I, I see. Yep. Very, very big of you to get to that point. Yes, I feel very magnanimous in my willingness yeah. to work, well, watch the new X Men. They're releasing the episodes one episode a week right now. So that's pretty fun. I think that's pretty fun to like. Uh, is it on Saturday mornings? Because it should be on Saturday mornings. I don't know if it is. Oh my word! That's a missed opportunity. <laughs> I think it's Wednesday. I think it's just Wednesday. Oh no! Saturday mornings, and then you I'm get so, yeah. you get your snacks, and you come in. Oh, uh, well, we'll see how we feel about that after we finish the last season of the animated series. Yep. Yep. Woo. All right, so thank you to Prophetic Music for our theme song, previously on X Men. Thank you. Thank you. you. <laughs> it's, that's not the song. It's a different song. Previously at X-Men is brought to you by the Radio Meanwhile Network. Other shows on the network that you may have heard from our April Fool's Look, host I got swap. You guys. Hilarious. <laughs> this Endurian Life, 90s music got me like, and 9021, here we go. Follow us on Facebook and be sure to follow the network on Facebook, Instagram, and threads for info on all of our shows. Please rate, subscribe, or share this show wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah. See you for season five. Bye.